The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans, because they suffered this? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, and you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Let it alone, sir, this year also, till I dig about it and put on manure. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a group of six-year-olds who were asked about the passage that you heard in the first reading. Why was Moses afraid to approach the burning bush? And a whole variety of responses came back. Some said they were afraid that Moses was afraid he would get the blame for setting it on fire. Others said he was angry with God because God had asked him to remove his shoes. And others said that Moses felt sorry for God because God was on fire. Now these responses are funny, they're amusing, but they are also true. They are true of all of us. You see, we have learned to give what sounds like the right answer. But deep down, there's something else we want to say. We want to actually say, I'm afraid of getting the blame for setting God on fire. Like the emperor's new clothes, deep down we know something is true, but we can't say it. This is indeed the shape of the world today. There are lots of things that are not true, but we have to pretend that they are true. We have to pretend two women can get married or a man can become a woman. We have to play along with this charade, the charade for British speakers. We're afraid to say the truth out loud, to speak our minds. We're afraid that we might get the blame for setting God on fire. Now, all the heresies in the church are childish ideas, but they've been theologized and bolstered by intelligence and stubbornness. But however great the intelligence, there is still that struggle among heretics to free themselves from this childishness. So, for example, the heresy of Jansenism, which basically says, Jansenism is very uh, popular, even if you've never heard of it. It's the idea that somehow we're never good enough for God. So Jansenism thinks, although it's not my fault, I am still to blame like Moses is blamed for setting God on fire. Or Pelagianism, this also is very popular these days, which is, I can somehow save myself. Pelagianism sees God as a denial of human freedom, rather than seeing God as the source of human freedom. And so it says, well, God made me take my shoes off even though I didn't want to. 
and I have to do God's will no matter what because God is terrible and he has all these demands and I must do that. And if I do all these things in their order, magically souls will erupt out of purgatory and whatever, all this sort of thing, okay? And then finally, process theology. This is, this is very common again in the world, especially now in Germany with the synodal way and all that nonsense. This is seeing God himself as in need of redemption. So it, this is saying God himself is on fire uh, and I'm on fire. And let's just say that arson is a good thing, not a bad thing. Let's just redefine the law and rewrite the catechism. And also besides this, I haven't got a bucket big enough to put God out. So all of these, these three examples I gave you are childish. They refer to me, to myself, in a self-important way. And all forms of guilt result from this sort of self-importance. This is not the humility of the Christian who stands in need of redemption. The gospel that we heard today is also about guilt. Who is to blame? The victims? The Tower of Siloam who fell on them? Were they worse sinners? And people thought victims sinned more. People still think victims sinned more. Why else do they say, why did this bad thing happen to me? I haven't done anything bad. Because deep down we think bad people deserve to be punished even in this life. And when we survive, maybe this guilt turns into some sort of anger. Anger against God. Why did you let this happen? Children build up guilt in a self-important way. Mommy and daddy are fighting because of me, because I didn't put my toys away on time. And then they got a divorce because of me. They don't understand. No, your parents got a divorce because they're awful. Your parents are terrible. But they think it's because of me, because of me. Bad things happen to me when I'm naughty. So if bad things happen to other people, they must have been naughty too. Deep down, we blame the victims or ourselves. And lacking both, we blame God. Now, just one chapter after this passage in Luke that you heard today, Jesus poses questions about someone building a tower and about a king fighting his enemies. Exactly, these two questions which mirror the true life events which are told to Jesus here in Luke chapter 13. The king, in Jesus' question, and the tower to be built, will both not be finished. They will both fail if they fail to renounce themselves, if they are interested too much in themselves. Perhaps here, we have to think that maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we should have asked the children a better question. Not why was Moses afraid to approach the burning bush, but why did Moses approach the burning bush at all in the end? And then we might have heard some different responses. They might have said, because Moses was drawn by wonder, by beauty, by heat, by light. This is about the fire, the fire that God is. Aristotle tells us the word for God, theos, comes from theein, to burn. God burns with love for us. The point of Jesus' parable at the end of this gospel passage is not, I'm worthless, I'm not bearing any fruit, therefore God is going to chop me down and burn me. The point is that God cares and tends each one of us. We might, not, we might think we don't deserve it, and if we do, we're right, we don't. But God's care comes to us nevertheless. This is how he loves us. He burns with love for us. Jesus goes up the mountain to die for us because he isn't thinking about himself, but thinking about us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.